Picture Norbert Honnold seeing the bass relief of Gradiva for the first time. He's wearing a blue shirt, brown shoes, and dark green pants. It's too warm to wear a jacket because of the summer in Rome. He's come to the city to do field work, but today he is taking the day to meet a friend of his former mentor. They meet earlier that day and luncheon together. The friend tells Honnold about how he's about to open a museum full of Roman art. Honnold is fascinated and starts to burst with curiosity, but the friend stops him before his questions can reach fruition. There is a critical engagement that must disrupt their conversation, but in consolation he hands Honnold the keys to the museum so that he may look around. They can discuss what Honnold saw when he returns. The 2B museum owner departs, and Honnold wanders around the labyrinth of the museum, impressed by its scope and grandeur. Walking to piece after piece, Honnold admires each one like a true scholar, discerning each work's period, genre, and subject without fail. But he can't help but notice the passion he carries for archaeology is beginning to wane, growing stale into a categorization of dates, places, and people whom he would never get to know. On the cusp of Malice, he rounds a corner and sees something utterly new. Before him hangs a bas relief, the beauty of a young Roman woman walking so curiously on her feet. Rediva. Tall, soft, and wavy hair, slender face. He is not drawn to this woman because of her perfect beauty. He has seen enough statues of Venus, but rather her sculpture, simplistically and realistically crafted, communicates life in stone, exuding a captivating dynamicism. Her movement especially strikes Honnold. Gradiva's head is bent forward, feet visible where he could see the toes just touching the ground, and her heels pointed skyward. This was a sign of confidence and agility to him, a peculiar grace. Processing all of this, Honnold's mouth goes agape. He freezes mid-stride, and his hands go up. The scene is so captivating, so real. You can see the expressions on Honnold's face. You can see his body language. You can turn your head around and see the empty museum Honnold has been wandering through. It's real. Only it's not. All the vividness of the scene is imagined. The, this critically important moment where Honnold finds the relief never actually appears in the text. The lighting, the choice of art pieces, save Gradiva, even Honnold and his reaction, they're all made up. But there's one kernel of truth. The entire scene takes inspiration from just one line in Jensen's Gradiva. On a visit to one of the great antique collections of Rome, Norbert Honnold had discovered a base relief which was exceptionally attractive to him. And that's it. This line describes the first time Honnold saw the Gradiva relief, but these few words alone do not bring this critical moment to life. In order to make sense of this text in Honnold's mission, we need to imagine and embellish this brief line by placing it within time and space, mapping onto it details that were never there. We have to imagine large portions of this scene, from the pretext as to why Honnold is in Rome, to the friend who owns a museum, and even to Honnold's gloomy state of mind. In our minds, we choreograph Honnold's body language as we see fit, imagining what he might have looked like if we were really there. This process is a mix of memory and imagination. We know this event happened, much like how we know people were living in Pompeii when Vesuvius erupted. We can't just see it, much of the same way Honnold cannot catch a glimpse of the authentic Gradiva walking throughout the novel. In any book, the need to imagine a line sparse in details requires placing it in an appropriate temporal context that is totally contained within our minds. Analogous to our discussions of memory and history throughout this course, where fact and fiction combine to produce a feeling of what might have been. But surely, such constructions only take place in events referenced in the book, not actually recounted. Let's go to another scene, one that's actually described in the text. Now imagine Honnold's room, where the book begins. Honnold is a distinguished archaeologist, a scholar, and it would only suit him to have a roaring fireplace, the archaeological paraphernalia, and the enormous armchair. 
It's where he keeps the Gradiva plaster cast, his prized possession. The scene is vivid and consistent with our image of Honnold. But wait, is this really what is described in the text? Have we not invented aspects of this scene too? Remember, we want to separate the fact from the fiction, the real from the imagined. Here's how the book explicitly describes Honnold's workroom. This had now been hanging on for some years on one of the walls in his workroom, all the other walls of which were lined with bookcases. Here it had the advantage of a position with the right light exposure on a wall visited, though but briefly, by the evening sun. So, in service of our task, and to our commitment to the integrity of this text, let us only imagine what is actually in the text. Surprised by how little we have to work with? Much like how scattered runes are all that remain from great civilization. Written words alone cannot compare to the ineffable realities they aim to describe. In forbidding our self-assumptions, we cannot even surmise that the bookcases are full of books. It's ironic how the relief alone retains its detail. This because of the relief comes, not from the text, but straight from reality. This is reality bleeding into fiction. However, even despite our best efforts to achieve the level of description, of abstraction inherent in the text itself, we have still subliminally mapped components not explicitly stated into the text. The shapes of the objects themselves have not been described. Rectangular bookcases? Their relation to each other is not described. How big is the workroom? And their basic positions in space are left to the reader. The bookcases are standing up? How is it possible to conceptualize of an object without relations to others, without a definitive position? Objects only become intelligible to us when they have temporal and spatial properties. There are an innumerable number of characteristics that are conditions of possibility for the comprehension of these objects, characteristics that need to be imagined and mentally constructed before we will be able to understand a text. It is impossible to read a text free of imagination. Any interpretation of a text can only be read in the context of mapping both imagined and specified components.